a very nice thin dough. You got an individual pie from a wood oven. Yeah. Served by a lovely Italian young lady. And it was a beautiful day. Well, the red sitting sauce. Outside the sauce the on it matters. The sauce that they use. Well, sure it does. But here. This was like a very uh, just straight pomodoro, sl uh, sliced, uh, mushroom, uh, sliced tomatoes. Right. Uh, not heavy on sauce. Just the, basically the tomatoes. Oh, uh, so the tomatoes carry the... A light the pizza, pizza with a uh, nice uh, cheese, nice fresh cheese. We've been to Grimaldi's, right, Len? Down by the... Down by the River Cafe, yeah. Right. right. We've been here to the number one, the Farrah Pizza, which was okay, pretty good. Didn't think it was... You know, like yeah, something. Do you remember the thing about the pharaohs that we liked so much? Is this old eighty-year-old guy who reaches into the oven? He's been he doing this his, He puts his hands and he takes the pizza out. Right. Doesn't use any gloves or anything. Just reaches right into the oven and pulls the, the pieces out. It's hard to get us away from Rocco's. That's right. So far, we've been testing cannolis, and we've been testing them each time we went to Rocco's. <laughs> we keep repeating that test, and it keeps on winning. In fact, Rocco, Rocco's for for cannoli and for espresso is a hands-down favorite on every test. And we have that little ritual where we order the cannoli, cut in half on two separate plates with a little extra cream, which they always kid us about. Don't forget the extra cream. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I know you guys. <laughs> so who is your best friend? Len is my best friend. It's been my best and closest friend for many years now. Harvey is my best friend. Uh, I'm not usually given to using the word best for almost anything. If you ask me who my favorite baseball team is, I can tell you it's the Mets. But if you ask me who the best team is, I can't tell you that. You cannot make a 35-year-old friendship in less than 35 years. There's no way to do that faster. When we first moved into the community, it was filled with young people, pioneers, because brownstone renovation was really in the late 60s, just getting momentum. And we were all involved in the same kinds of things. We were all looking for contractors or doing the work ourselves and sharing in those experiences. We had one of the first working bathrooms on Bergen Street on our block and several friends used to come over and knock on the door with a towel and a cake of soap in their hands at the end of the day because they didn't have a working shower yet. It wasn't just a, you know, a cup of sugar from your neighbor. You might need a screwdriver, you might need a piece of 2 by 4 a piece of sheetrock, some extra paint, some sandpaper. And in fact, your whole kitchen might be kaplunk. And everybody understood that. And so people would, oh, your refrigerator's not working. Why don't you put your stuff in my refrigerator? You can come over and get it with you. Here's a key. You just have to come over and get it whenever you want it. And it was a very warm and very supportive community. Harvey lived in the house behind ours. When I met Len, our buildings were on two different streets, but our gardens butt into each other, so we were sort of back to back. And the first day that we came to see the house, Judy and I and the broker went out into the backyard. Well, the grass and everything in the backyard hadn't been tended to for years, and it was up around shoulder height. And we're wading through the, <laughs> the weeds. And I was on the top floor of my building, and I was scraping the window frame so they could be repainted. I saw them in the backyard. I yelled out, you know, hello. And I hear this voice from the backyard over the fence. And Len yelled back, how you doing? And I said, are you guys planning to buy that place? He said, well, I'm thinking about it. I said, well, if you do plan to do that, 
we need a, new, a wall there. We need a cinder block wall, something to hold the dirt back, and we probably need a fence. And he said, oh, I'm all for it. I said, okay. I said, so we'll be partners when that time comes. He said, 50-50 partners, absolutely. And that was it. I knew that. Uh, I liked that guy. It was really easy. It was the easiest deal of any significance I've ever done. So we built a fence that looked like a solid fence across, but in fact, we took a couple of planks of this fence and we put hinges on them, self-closing hinges, so that we could actually open up the fence and one to the other's yard move from one house to the other without having to go out to the front and all the way around the street. Can you just kind of show us where the... Uh here, it was right here. This board would hinge this way, and that board would hinge that way, which made a wide enough passage to step through. That's true. <laughs> now, this is, these are different neighbors, so we don't do that anymore. So we had this little secret passageway between us, and that's part of what made the, you know, the friendship flourish. When I met Len in 1968, his daughter Marjorie was not yet born. She was on the way, but not yet born. So I know her for all of her life. So what role does food play in your friendship with Len? Oh, in my friendship with Len, well, we meet over food. It's the element that brings us together most often. Sometimes it's breakfast, sometimes it's brunch, sometimes it's lunch, sometimes it's dinner. Food is the attraction, and we go and we have our favorite places. This is the place right here, and they make an extraordinary focaccio pizza. I'm filming it. Could we do the eggplant? Look at them all, honey. The olives and feta cheese. Old fashioned way. Every bite, you dream of Italy. <laughs> oh, I like that. It's a free country. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. I wrote one. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's a will. It's been witnessed. It has been witnessed? Witnessed by Sam down in the uh, postnet. Oh, okay. Well, that's a will. But it's not very... Uh, I mean, it's not very, um... It's a will, Dad. It's a will for now. It's fine. I guess When it's, you get back... I guess it's legal. Enough for a snack, Arnie. Well, I'll, I'll put an hour in, right? Oh, okay. So tomorrow is uh, lunch, and, uh, and then all the facilities, and then we'll go out to the restaurant. That was cold all morning. Why didn't I put my vest on? I don't know. Len was the person that taught me to eat Japanese food. This goes back like more than 30 years when there weren't so many sushi places. I have a garment for you if you want it. I have a pullover blue, like this, in blue. Yes. It's in the car. Do you want that? Do you mind? Of course I don't mind. When I came to the table, it was really weird. You know, because sushi looks weird if you never saw it before. And I was put off by it. I said, I can't do that. He said, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. So what else do we need, salmon and tuna? Salmon tuna? Salmon and tuna are so innocent, they taste like cooked fish. So I took his word for it, and I tried it. It wasn't brilliant, but it wasn't bad. But I wouldn't touch anything else. And he was trying to push this thing called uni, sea urchin. And for anybody who's had any kind of experience with sushi, you know that that's, like, really gross if you don't like it. If you like it. It still looks gross, but it's fantastic. As the years went by, I'd order a deluxe sushi, which came with uni, and I'd say to the guy, just hold the uni, do not give me the uni. Yeah. And one day, the cool. chef puts out my plate, and it has uni on it. And I said, you know I don't eat uni. Until I'm pressed, or until I'm implored to, until there's no choice, I really don't have to. He looked at me with steely eyes, and he said, all Japanese love uni. And I got the message. So 
for the first time, I gave it a try. And of course, it was fantastic. And I've been like stuck on uni ever since. Okay, so we need yeah. a sorted sushi plate with uni. Um, uni? I'm sure we don't have the uni right now. You don't have uni now? Uh huh. Oh, okay. We're right. Don't have uni. Yamato? Marge, you've destroyed Marge's whole film. <laughs> you have nato? Nato? You don't know what nato is? No. Uh, you should ask someone here. He was a copywriter at Ogilvy and Mather. And I was a designer who wanted to try his hand at art direction. So he and I got an account and we did advertising for the Harry Gitlin Lighting Company. We did that for almost 10 years. Harry Gitlin. The, the best kept secret, secret in life. <laughs> <laughs> and we did some very good ads, actually, that won awards. Find every Harry in this magazine and win one of these classic lamps. You can't stump Harry, that you can design anything you want, and Harry will make it for you. If you can think it up, he can make it. And got the readers to really focus on Harry Gitlin in order to count the number of times his name appeared in the magazine. Didn't make a whole lot of money at it, but we had a lot of fun. And we actually succeeded ourselves out of an account because we were so successful that they got much bigger than they ever wanted to get. This is, was all new for me. I had never done advertising before. And I wouldn't have been able to do it unless uh, I had Harvey. We had very different working styles. Harvey's working style was um, I'm interested to hear this because it's so long ago. To, uh, scribble thoughts on a yellow pad, then tear the thoughts into like individual thoughts and spread them out on a table. And this would start maybe at nine o'clock at night. Early. Uh, well, ten o'clock. <laughs> and usually, since Harvey could only work to a deadline. At the very last moment, when the presentation was due, 10 o'clock meeting the next morning, and I had to still sketch up whatever solution we came to, we would come to a final line of copy at about 3 in the morning, maybe 4. Sounds right. <laughs> By which time I had been asleep three or four times. Yeah, you had to get it done in a hurry, right? <laughs> Did you guys ever drive each other crazy? We still do. Well, I mean, that's the process of life. The challenge of, uh, you know, bandying about well, the great issues of the world right. and coming to the only conclusions that really matter, your own. <laughs> <laughs> I had a scenario that the Democrats get a vote through on withdrawal and Lieberman, because he is still at the committee hearing yesterday, we're still saying that uh, we're going for victory. I mean, he's like Bush, he's like delusional. Ray, where are you? So you know he's in an enormously powerful position as an independent. If he switches, the Senate turns back to the Republicans. Well, yeah. it may, they may win the vote, the honor vote, but they don't, contr they don't control the it wouldn't change the control of the chairmanship unless he became a Republican. That's what I'm saying. If he switches. Oh. Well, it's never going to happen. With your mouth to God's ears. In a couple of years of becoming neighbors, Harvey came over and asked me if he could borrow my car. It was a BMW which I had recently got and I was just not particularly comfortable with sharing it. And I said, no. And Harvey has never let me forget it for all these years. <laughs> it's now become kind of like a running gag between us. He would say the next time he has a car that I can drive it whenever I want to, considering he's probably never going to buy another car so he can make that statement. You can drive the hearse. <laughs> The Hearst. <laughs> Maybe just the clams and the coca salad. Yeah, that's good. You want a beer? You want to split a beer? No, I'll split one with you. So we just want two things. We want some clams and some... Uh... Uh, we're going to have the octopus salad and okay. the uh, clams. Mm. All right, left to go.
live in Brazil for two years, and I come back as a single guy. And what I found was that my single life was the butt of a lot of conversations and a lot of fun that people were having, and it was like I was a soap opera. And I didn't like that. And after a couple of years of that, I said, you know what, I'm going to go move to Manhattan in a place where not everybody knows me and knows my past. And I moved to Manhattan and Greenwich Village for a year and a half after being there. That's when I met Gay. We discovered Soho in 1979. We got a place with almost 2,400 square feet, 12-foot ceilings, windows everywhere for $87,000 or $85,000. Harvey asked me to design almost every place he ever lived in. When our daughter was born, the place was absolutely at its worst in terms of renovation. Almost nothing that was functioning it was okay for adults who were able to make do, but now a newborn baby would not work. So Len did what any best friend and good architect and designer who wanted to keep the job rolling would do was he invited us to stay at his apartment in Brooklyn. And by this time, Len was now on his own. He was separated and single. And he had a small two-bedroom apartment in Brooklyn Heights that had a small second bedroom, typically used by his daughter. But we somehow got some special dispensation. And so Gay and I and newborn Aria lived there, but it was really small. In fact, there wasn't even room for a crib. So our daughter slept in a drawer in Len's dresser. <laughs> and that's where she spent the first few weeks of her life. Harvey asked me to design almost every place he ever lived in. We received literally hundreds of compliments over the nearly 30 years we owned the place. Well, I designed into the loft, which was on two levels. The kitchen was at a raised level. A set of uh, wide stairs, carpeted stairs, which were wide enough to sit comfortably on. So in effect, we were trying to recreate the feeling of a stoop from a brownstone, and we were trying to recreate it within the loft in Soho. An element of brownstone living is the front stoop of a brownstone where people on nice days tend to hang out. It's a very neighborly thing to do, and it's part of Brooklyn brownstone tradition. When Harvey and Gay would entertain, people loved to just hang out on the steps. Living will and durable power of attorney. Okay, hold on. Damn, I, need I do not want what I sign here, initial, I do not want my life to be prolonged, nor do I want life-sustaining treatment to be provided or continued if my agent believes the burdens of this treatment outweigh the expected benefits. I want my agent to consider uh, the relief of suffering, the expense involved, and the quality as well as the possible extension of my life. I think issues of health between all friends are, by definition, issues that, that you accept and have to deal with. You're my agent. It's the, it's the high how you're doing when you're 25 years old or 30 or 35 years old. It's a throwaway question. Oh, I'm fine. And you, when you're 55 or 60 or 65, and you ask that question, or someone asks that question of you, they better be ready for an answer. Of course, the answer could be, well, it could be better, my leg hurts, my head hurts, my arm's not working anymore, my teeth are falling out, who knows what. Years ago, Harvey introduced me to uh, Cheryl, who was married to Ed. Harvey's known her since he was a teenager. Well, we were like a group, and we used to go out and celebrate each other's birthdays every year in Chinatown. And unfortunately, Ed passed away several years ago. Ed was, uh, for me, was, the, was really my first loss of a peer. You know, a close friend and a peer. It made it even more difficult understanding Cheryl's love for Ed and her pain and, you know, and, and losing Ed. It was just magnified, Ed's loss. And I, I feel, uh, and I've said this to Len many times, that I feel the loss of Ed, that I'm aware of the loss of Ed. It isn't on a, it's a present, it's still a very present loss. When the doctor called the meeting, 
uh, of the family, we were at the table when the doctor came out and gave us his yeah, uh, diagnosis. And that was a very sad moment because we knew that pancreatic cancer is a death sentence, essentially. And uh, so we were present from at the beginning of the diagnosis and watched Ed decline and uh, it, was, it was very difficult. At the end, uh, death becomes a gift. Yeah. We still have a, a few laughs around Ed, especially if we go to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> we still laugh about his sweet and sour chicken, lousy taste and food. Yes. You're not going to order that dish, are you, Ed? Come on. Really? Have but then, truth be known, when the sweet and sour chicken came out, whose chopsticks were in the bowl first? Harvey's! <laughs> I'm so full. You want some more uh, salad, Harvey? No. <laughs> but the olive's alive. <laughs> Miss me. How about that for a quick moment? I may be getting ready for my own day. I thought you might stop it in the middle. Yeah. Can you see me? Oh, can I? <laughs> Ooh. Smoochy, smoochy. <laughs> my papa. That's the kind of kiss Grandpa used to give. Yeah, right. <laughs> Len has known for many years that he was born with only one functional kidney. He also learned that he had a kidney disease that was slowly diminishing the function of the one kidney he had and that one day he would either need a kidney transplant or he would have to be on kidney dialysis. Many years ago my dear friend Harvey volunteered to donate a kidney to me. So Harvey and I go to New York University Hospital to meet with a nephrologist and he asked us certain background questions. Well, for every question Harvey had uh, a rather unsettling response. And at one point the doctor looked at Harvey and he said, you know, I think Len is in better shape than you are. <laughs> Harvey and I went to lunch, and we had the biggest laugh you could possibly imagine. It was both sadness, joy that he had volunteered, was loving enough to volunteer. You've led me down this path. Mm. Mm. I don't know where the return, the re return for this is. <laughs> it's hell and damnation for us both. Older <laughs> uh, I get, the dumber I get. We've been laughing about that for 15 years. <laughs> it's great to be approaching 70 and feel younger. <laughs> that's, that's terrific stuff, man. Describe 12 years of your life where, for a lot of that time, you didn't care whether you got up in the morning or not. The dialysis, I was existing. I wasn't thriving. I, I didn't feel alive. And right now, I feel so alive. <laughs> it's really. It's like that Machado poem that I read New Year's. Uh, I thought my fire was out and stirred the ashes and burnt my fingers. Ready. You guys oh, you get Rocco's the best. We got that cannoli split. We'll okay, so you want two money. double espressos right. and Super one, one cannoli cut in half with extra cream. There's my okay. man. Super hot, super right. strong. It's and wait a minute. Hands. Are we... <laughs> to be treated, you're gonna make the espresso. I'm gonna do it. Ah, don't, don't I always do it? Oh, <laughs> look at this. Okay. Oh hey, let me get the cannoli down. Extra cream for them because they like that cannoli cream. There you, there you go. go. Uh -huh. This is the hardest part now. Yeah. You get it even, I know. Otherwise, you have a fight. Talk about that. surgeons. There you go. <laughs> let me just give it that. Little. Oh my God! Oh, I love it. Pathway to a lifelong friendship. Right? We created it, and uh, I don't think these people who rebuilt this family so have that. 
All fences should have a door like that. That's a really good fence. And two forks and I'll give you another plate. No more sugar, we're on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, not only do you get the bigger feet, but he takes well, the fork. He place. takes the fork that's got the extra cream yeah. on it. <laughs> I was thinking about what was best for you, I swear. And I said, you know what? Less is best. <laughs> Yeah.